Josh and I will talk about some things that we think are interesting and would be applicable to everyone. We can get into a lot of depth. We have a small audience. So we'll just jump in and get started and then we'll move to Q&A in a little bit. I started following Josh maybe like five months ago um, and thought it was, I really enjoyed his content and then was lucky one day because I thought Josh was like way out in the stratosphere and I was like down here on, on earth on my you LinkedIn are, game. You are, you are, that's true. No, <laughs> and, uh, and one day he just messaged me and was like, hey, do you want to come on my podcast? I liked the, the post that you said. Um, and so we did the podcast and had like an incredible conversation that went in a lot of different directions about, um, about prospecting and how Josh was asking me if someone was trying to sell to me how they should try to prospect to me. We got into a lot of different conversations. One of them was about how companies score SD, uh, sales development representatives or business development representatives, which is kind of interesting. So maybe we'll get into there. But the, the place that we'll start, and I think Josh can add some color to this, is that when you're doing prospecting and you're reaching out to someone, 98% of people are not in buy mode. They're not actively looking for what we do. And so I was hoping you could just expand on that topic and then we can go in a little yeah, different direction. Raise your hand if you're buying a house right now. Uh, raise your hand if you might buy a house one day. That's outbound. When you're going outbound, when you're knocking on doors, most of the time people aren't actively looking for what it is that you're selling. They're not in buy mode. There's two ways to get business. You either knock on a door or you have people knock on your door. Two ways to get business. The latter way is much better because people are knocking on your door saying, what do you have for me? It takes a little more time, but the people are ready to buy. When you're knocking on someone else's door, they may meet with you, but they're not ready to buy right now. Less than two or 3% are. So you, although we'll teach you some strategies on how to start those conversations, the hard part is what do you do until they're ready to buy? How do you stay top of mind? Quick example, I was in the market for a barbecue. The barbecue guys knew that I wasn't ready to buy. And what they did every month is they'd send me a video of how to make better steak, how to grill potatoes, how to make corn. And because they were sending me this content and it was actually helping me become a better griller, when the other side of my grill went out, the first people and the only people I thought of are the barbecue guys. So that's the, the key pieces here is, do we want to talk about a strategy where we're knocking on doors and if we are, what do we do when people aren't ready to buy? Or can we talk about a strategy of how do we get people to knock on our doors, mm -hmm. which is kind of what Chris and I do for our businesses. People are now knocking on our doors versus us knocking on their doors. And so how should people get, like, lay out a framework of how you do it. Like, how do you get people to knock on doors? Knock first, on your doors. Sorry. Yeah, the first thing we have to do is we have to know who our boss is. And you might think it's the person you work for, but I think the boss is the actual person you're selling to because they're actually paying your money. They're paying your salary. And most people don't know their boss because they've never done their boss's job. So the first order of business is, how do I get to understand the person I'm selling to at a very specific and detailed level? That's what I call crispy. I'll give you an example. I'm going to tell you the story of two companies that are trying to sell me a bike saddle. I happen to be a triathlete biker. And you tell me which of these messages resonates more with you if you had to pick one, A or B. So here's A. We sell amazing bike saddles. They are comfortable. They are made of the finest leather around, and they are super light, and they are used by these famous triathletes. That's message A. And here's message B, outbound message. Josh, I noticed that you do Ironman races and that you're doing Cozumel, but you didn't finish. If you're like a lot of the triathletes that are doing Ironman distance races, you're taking six-hour bike rides on Saturday. And right at around hour three, it starts to happen. You get numbness and chafing, have to pull over and get off your bike. Which of those two messages do you think is going to resonate more with a triathlete, A or B? B, because B is speaking specifically to that person's life and their world. And so you have to get inside their mind. And you have to know, how are they getting the job today done? Six-hour ride, hour three, numbness, chafing, not will save you time and money. A lot of people gloss over getting to know their job of their boss. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest mistake people make. How do you get to know your boss? A couple, couple ways. Best way, number one way, and it might seem blatantly obvious, is actually talk to people that bought your product. 
preferably within the last 30 to 45 days, using an approach called jobs to be done. It's a framework for understanding what causes people to buy. And you can't ask people because they won't tell you. Ask someone why they bought PX90, they'll say to lose weight. Do a jobs to be done interview on them and they'll say stuff like this, well, I'm going to my reunion, I didn't want my thighs to rub together and I wanted to hook up with that person in high school that I never quite got to be with. That's the crispy stuff that you need. So way number one, interview customers that recently bought using jobs to be done. Strategy number two, if you can't get that, listen to calls that you're having with people that are knocking on your door about what events and circumstances happened that caused them to want to talk to you because nobody wants to talk to you in sales. I'd rather just live with the pixel out on my TV. But something happened that the struggle was big enough where I'm now picking up the phone and wanting to talk to you and I want to know what those struggle moments were. You, were, you did what? You tried what? That didn't work. Then you did what? Then that didn't work. And those stories, you want to put the customer's words in a lingo library Google Doc. And they'll write your marketing messages for you. I, that I, got, uh, I got the third approach, yeah. which I've used sometimes given that you have the resources or the customers are nearby, called job shadowing, where you actually go and, f and shadow your customer for a day. And it's best if you shadow some that don't use your product and others that do. And then you ask the ones when they decide to use something or do something, why'd you do it that way? Why did you decide to do that? Um, I learned a lot of interesting things that I could then deploy in my marketing, especially when you're marketing or selling to someone that isn't like you. So if you're a salesperson selling to a salesperson, some of Josh's jobs might work better. But if you're a salesperson or a marketer selling to an ICU physician or an additive manufacturer or something, it's much more challenging to live in their world. And so that's a strategy that if you can find someone friendly and say, hey, I'm really trying to learn this thing, do you mind if I spend a couple hours with you and understand your job in a more detailed level and ask you some questions, um, you can really learn a lot that then allows you to use those, that information to either create content or create messaging that then helps you communicate. Because what, what the only thing that we're talking about here is effective communication with people that are open to buying your product or that would get value out of your product, right? Yeah, you gotta understand, everybody's making progress when you call them. Everybody's getting from point A to point B the best way they know how. I'm in the kitchen trying to make french fries. I'm using a seven inch knife. I'm slicing the potatoes by hand. The kitchen's a mess. The french fries stink and they're soggy. The family doesn't like it and they throw half away, but this is the only way I know how to make fries. So from my perspective, I'm getting the job done. But people are always open to self-betterment. It's why you're here. We always want to be a better version of ourselves tomorrow. But I don't know what's possible. From my view, this is how I make the french fries. I have no idea what this potato peel 3000 is. So understanding the progress people want to make and how you can help them level up. It's not always about a problem, it's about what's possible. And I'll give you a great story that'll really drive this home. My wife and I, she's back there, were in the mall, and I was just trying to kill some time while she was shopping. I didn't need anything. I walked into a running store, and if the associate said, do you have any problems, what would I have said? If she said, can I help you, what would I have said? But she didn't ask any of those things. She asked a really smart question. Remember, I didn't need anything. She looked down, looked at my sneakers, and she said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She said, what distance? I said, marathon. And then she asked a great question. It's called an illumination question, and it's extremely powerful. And here's what she said. Have you ever had a running gait test? And I said, what's that? Moments later, I'm on a treadmill. I'm being recorded. She looks at the tape with me and she goes, look at your feet, they're pronated. And did you know that if you're running in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet and you're doing long distance races, that you could get injured on a long run? And as an old Jewish man, I'm petrified of getting injured on a long distance run. And then she said, if you'd like, we could take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And she made a $220 sale. She did not ask me about a problem. What did she do? 
She found one. And the best prospectors and the best salespeople find problems. They don't ask about them. They shine a light on what's possible. Are you aware of gastrointestinal distress that's typically caused by gels and electrolyte fluids? Oh my God, I, I eat gels and electrolyte fluids. What is that? The news does this well, right? There's something wrong with your peas, news at 11. Oh my God, what's wrong with my peas? So shine a light, illumination questions are super powerful. What does your prospect not know that can hurt them? Literally, in my case. Because people want to be better, but you have to know what better is. And you have to ask these questions that allow them to come to the conclusion themselves. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So let's talk through what different ways you could get into that conversation, right? You yeah. can be in the mall and talk to someone face to face. There's an option. You could call or email someone directly. Someone else that likes your product could tell them about it and then they would know about it. So they could find you in Google or an internet search or through a video or different things like that. Um, what other, what other options are yeah, there? So There's a lot of different ways for someone to actually become engaged. Yeah, let's talk about the hardest way. Let's talk about cold outreach. Cold call, cold email, because that's my specialty. Like cold, cold, cold outreach. I don't have time to like, make video. I mean, it's a great. We're going to talk about people getting on knocking your door, but in the beginning, cold outreach. So let's set something up. Let's set up someone that has an expensive triathlon bike, like it's a $20,000 bike. And they have a bike rack that they put the bike on and they bring it to A1A and they go biking. And then when they're done, they put the bike on the bike rack and they go into 7-Eleven and they buy a Gatorade and they drink it and hang out with their friends. And I sell bike racks. How am I gonna sell a bike rack to a triathlete that has a bike rack? I gotta find out what that person doesn't know about that bike rack that could hurt them, or I have to show them what's possible. So with the case of the bike rack, what I realized is that that bike rack isn't as safe as they think it is and secure. So in my email, this was my first sentence. Hey Josh, notice that you bike on A1A all the time. Are you aware that most triathlon rear-mounted bike locks can be picked in 10 seconds with a paper clip, which is shorter than the amount of time it takes for you to go into 7-Eleven and get a Gatorade. Now, I got a $20,000 bike, and I didn't know that, so my ears are now perked up. He shined a light on a problem I didn't know I had, and now I'm going to read the next sentence. One more example, go into a bike store to get Gatorade. Walk out spending 300 bucks. Just happened three weeks ago. How'd the guy do it? Hey Josh, are you aware that the new Continental 7000s are more puncture resistant and faster? What? Where are they? I want them. Because people want self-betterment. It's why you're here. Don't ask me if I want new bike tires, what would I say? Most salespeople are asking people about their problems. And from an outbound perspective, I don't have any until you find some and scare me or show me what's possible. What, what, what do your prospects not know that can hurt them? So a prospect that doesn't have my problem is spending time doing things manually with my software and help them do it. Super generic. Save time and money. What specifically are they doing? And why does it suck? And how much time? Because I want to just, before I get you here, because this is a big point. Everyone lives with problems all the time. You're living with a problem right now. You're not doing anything about it because the problem's small. I have a pixel out on my TV. But it's not a big enough problem. Problems have to be intense and frequent. If I'm doing something and I'm grilling once a year, it's not a big enough problem. So talk to me about this big, terrible, time-consuming thing. So several times a week, they're wasting time sifting through emails when they could have more ready access. Sifting through emails for what purpose? They're finding a request from one of their customers, one of their, the people that they serve. So what if it's t so what, what are they looking for? What, what are, they, are they not able to find it? Uh, they may have to search through chain or email conversations to find one email 
instead of having everything in one place. And okay, like a, so you said like a project management. So, so to Chris's point, what I'd want to see is, and he's a great idea, I'd want to watch that. Because what I'd want to know is, is it really taking them that much time or is it taking them 10 seconds? Because if it's taking them 10 seconds, I don't care, it's a pixel. If it's taking them five hours, I care. Problems have to be big and expensive. So that's outbound. That's outbound. I think we want to go deep. I think the, va the value here would be content marketing on LinkedIn. You and I both do it well. Um, there'll probably be questions that we can dive in deeper on that side, but I'll kind of like lay out my framework for how I think about it. So on LinkedIn, you basically need two things. You need to have content that speaks to the audience that you're trying to speak to. Ideally, if it's what they care about, not necessarily related to your product, and you need to have those people be able to see it. There's a lot of people that have good content that doesn't get seen. We talked about that at dinner. Whether it's a brand or whether it's a person that's trying to sell something on LinkedIn or market it or something, they create great videos that three people see. So how do you get people to see them? The best strategy that I found is to make connections with people on LinkedIn that are active on the platform. So how do you find out if they're active on the platform? The best way that I found is to follow people that talk about things that are similar to what you would want to talk about. So people that, people that already have an audience of who you're going after. And then you look at the people that liked their last seven posts and you go and connect with the people that, are that have the relevant headlines and titles inside of that. The reason it's better than going through Sales Navigator and doing that is because you know they use the platform every day. They liked his last seven posts. As opposed to if you find them on Sales Navigator, they might have not logged in for six years, and then you have a connection that's never going to see your stuff. That's, so find the people that are on the platform that would want to see your information. And then how do you produce content consistently that resonates with that audience? And we can definitely go into details and questions about how to do that, because I know that I'm not going into enough depth right here. Um, the way that I think about content on that perspective is you need a mix of depth and width. So width being how do you get a lot of people to see it, depth being how do you go really deep into your own subject matter. A lot of people have a lo get a lot of views and talk about a lot of gen general things. They have no depth. And that's why it doesn't work. You have to show that you're an expert in what you're doing. You have to go deep. Another way to go deep is to really have good conversations in comments. Is one really strong way that I've found to start to connect with people at a level. And the last thing is your mindset. And so I've used LinkedIn every, every day for several hours a day for the past eight or 10 months. Which is why you have that pale sort of skin? No, you're good. I just, I just got in the sun today. <laughs> I'm in Miami. Um, and have never once thought in a message, comment, post, or anything about trying to sell something. And I can say that with complete confidence. And so the only thing that I'm doing is trying to give people information that makes them better, that then creates awareness about me and what I do, and then my profile and my website do my selling for me. So I never have to do selling on the platform. Um, and I think that's a, it's a really interesting strategy to debate. I know people that have a hybrid strategy where they give a lot, and at some point they ask. And I think that I've seen that work really well too. I think both can work. Um, the key is that you need to give first in order to get someone's attention and build their trust, which then allows you to be able to make the ask. So you are a teacher. And people are your students. So let me ask you a question. Let's say you move to a new town and you get sick. Like, not just a cough, but you're really sick. And you don't know any doctors in the town at all. None. And you open up your computer and you start to search for doctors. And there's only two in the town. One of them is Dr. Bob. And the other one is Dr. Oz. And they both cost the same amount of money. Which one are you going to go to? Oz. 
Yeah, he's doing what? He's teaching. He's teaching you things that you care about at your house, and he's doing it, more importantly, in an entertaining way. So you have to learn how to teach, and you probably didn't go to school to teach. Not enough to communicate information. People communicate information all the time. Boring. You've got to entertain. So the series that I created with my wife called I Teach My Wife Sales, I could have communicated that content in a number of ways. But I have my wife. I bring her on screen. We raise a question that happened to her during the day with her mom who's getting miserable at an old, faci- old age facility. And I say, what does this have to do with sales? And I put her on the spot, and she fumbles, and we kind of get through it. And it's funny. And it's entertaining. <laughs> Because if you can't entertain people and you're not different, you are a white circle in a sea of white circles. You're another vanilla scoop with a PowerPoint presentation. You have to be a mint scoop in the sea of white scoops. And step one in the process, where I think we're both aligned, is you have to know what other people want to get better at. What makes people happier? So for me, it's sales stuff. I had a cold call, I had a cold email. What happens when someone says, send me some information? What happens when someone says, I'm already working with a vendor? What do I say? People just want to be told, what do I do? What do I say? What do your prospects want to know? What are your prospects frequently asked questions? What are some topics that your prospects care about? Uh, Reliability. Turn it around. What's a question they typically will ask that they might per- turn into Google? Like, so for me, how do I get cold emails response rates higher? How do I, what, what, what might they type in? How do I do this? What, what's, what's this? How do I know how to do this? What might they want to know? Um, how can they, probably, how can they get more work out the door with, with their current resources without hiring? Or what can they use for temporary support? You have an opinion about that? Sorry? You have an opinion about that? How to do that? You have a perspective on it? Yeah, it's my company. No? <laughs> that's where we're getting into craziness, right? Because that's like, so what can you teach them that they don't know? My approach is to try and teach them about the different areas of inefficiency within their business, not just with the things that my company could specifically help them with, but other areas too that my company doesn't have. Uh-huh. So two quick strategies. Chris will talk about one and I'll talk about one. I don't want to start to create my own content from scratch, which is hard. First strategy, what are the questions your prospects are already asking? Go to Quora, go online. What are they already asking? And just answer those questions. A question I typically get is this, and here's my take. But make sure you have a take. Make sure you're punching someone in the mouth and make sure it's a perspective. That is not saying, in order to lose weight, stop eating. Not exciting. Have a perspective on it. So what are the questions your prospects are asking or they should be asking? What's your take on it? And if you don't have a take, read about a bunch of takes and form your own take and then communicate it in a way that's interesting. Put on a freaking yellow hat. I don't care. Something that shows your personality. No offense, and I'll be a little hard, and I know this is a group setting, and I want you to succeed, but when you teach me something, don't sound like the teacher from the Ferris Bueller movie. It's not enough that you know your domain. It's not enough. I went and did a guest lecture at a college. These professors knew their domain, but I fell asleep in class because they didn't know how to entertain. There's a book called The Art of Explanation. Read it. Be a thespian. Show your personality. You all have them. People don't lose their personalities when they come to work. Mm -hmm. They want to laugh. They're still watching Netflix, even though they're lawyers. Right? Yes. We have a voucher. Mm, how do you sort of get to that, that comfort level, or how do you convey at least, or you know, that comfort level immediately Um, Phenomenal question. And here's the answer. Be yourself. Uh Like you have a personality that's very different than my, like you're, teach my wife shale shtick's not going to work with you. That's my personality. I make self-deprecating humor about myself being Jewish and old and have a receding hairline. I bring my wife into it. She talks about erections. She just did last week. Like she's all (laughs) over the place talking about stuff. Be your personality. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll feel on camera and your writing style. It's like a muscle. Uh And it's great at the beginning because no one's paying attention to you anyway. Just start writing and coming into your own. It's like everything you're good at now, you sucked at in the beginning. Embrace it and just do it and you'll come into your voice. But be you, your authentic you, whatever that is. That'll come through. Uh Two strategies that could work for you. 
the first one that I think is awesome is that I'll, people will ask me questions or send me a message on LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm struggling with running Facebook ads. You've been talking about them. Could you like help me with them? And I'll take a 15 minute call for free. I'll take a camera. They'll ask me the question and I'll film my answer and there's the content. And you do that five times a day, you're asking about consistency. That's one way to do it. The, almost the exact reverse is to contact people that are like people that you're trying to sell to and ask them questions. And record, either, whether you record it or not, you get the information and then you create a perspective and then you can communicate, you can form your perspective based on their input and then communicate it to the world. Both of those ways work. So I figure it to you it's it's like the approach where you're like, all right, I have to come up with a social media post or an email blast, whatever it is. And so you're sitting there and then you're trying to actively think of it as opposed to what you're saying, which is like, all right, just set it up. Like, and then go so from there. Right, right. it's, and, and that's going to be the best content you can produce anyway because you're not trying. It perpetuates. So I'll, I'll post something and then I'll have, at the beginning, it was three comments. Now it's like 100 comments or more. And I'll have conversations inside the comments, and then I'll say so, like one sentence that was smart in the comment, and then that one sentence becomes a post, and it just continues on and on. And that's how you get to a level of consistency. So, so congratulations, you have your own show. Right? So when I first started my business, the first thing that I did was I created a TV show on LinkedIn, just like day one. And I reached out to a VP of sales that worked for a company called Outreach that sells to a ton of salespeople. And my message to him on LinkedIn was, hey, my name is Josh. I have a show on LinkedIn where I interview sales leaders about how they're growing high-performance sales teams. Would love to interview you and get your take on a couple topics. He's like, would love to be on your show. Did he Google my show? Does he know anything about my show? He was guest number one, Mark Kozaglo over at Outreach. And I interviewed him and I posted it to LinkedIn. And Mark Kozaglo has a big reach. And I tagged him and people saw that. And they're like, who is this guy, Josh Brunk? And I just kept interviewing people. You don't need a podcast. Just turn on your webcam on Zoom, reach out to your ideal customers, create a show, and get their take on things. People love to talk about their take on things. It's an ego boost. And I have a massive success with that. That's why my podcast, a lot of times I'll reach out to prospects and invite them on as a guest. And they share content. We get to know each other and they become a customer. You don't need a podcast. Just do that on LinkedIn. That would be, that's a great it's suggestion, a great like day, day one. Day one. Yeah. That's how I started too, with the Zoom show. With the Zoom show, yeah. yeah. Congratulations, you have your own Zoom show. Congratulations. Now, you have to know how to interview people, because you can't suck. So how do you learn how to interview people? Does anyone know? It's really tricky. You spell, I'll spell it out for you guys, okay? G-O, <laughs> write this down, G-O-O-G-L-E. And then be curious, right? Yeah. Just be curious. Learn like, how to, yeah. Learn why? How? To, yeah. how? Learn how to interview people. Listen, yeah. listen to people that are interviewing people well. Because I've been on a lot of podcasts before and, and it sucked because they were just checked out. It's like that person that you're talking to and they're like looking at their phone every once in a while. As opposed to love them or hate them, Howard Stern to me is one of the best interviewers I've ever heard because he's really in it, man. And he gets people saying stuff that they don't say anywhere else. Be like that. Don't ask the usual questions. I mean, I'm interviewing a New York Times bestselling author, this guy, Chris Voss, a former hostage negotiator, wrote a New York Times bestselling book called Never Split the Difference. I wrote him one cold email, and he bet he's gonna be on my show. The guy's been interviewed a hundred times. I can't ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. So learn how, to, learn how to be an interviewer. Mm -hmm. When you do the interviews, yeah. you get the content, you get relationships with prospects, you get market research and customers all in one. Yeah, and it feels good to do outreach like that. Rather than selling your thing, I'm doing a show. Or I'm hosting another great outreach strategy. And Chris will get into a little bit of this as well. When I do outbound, I don't set up outbound demos. I set up outbound one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions where I'm essentially teaching somebody a topic about something they're interested in. It's like going to a webinar, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. Hi, my name is Josh, and I'm calling to see if you'd be open to attending some webinars we com coming up about trends and prospecting, and I got a couple questions to see if this would be something you'd be interested in. You have a second. Sure. Webinars, uh, 2 o'clock. And then I'm just going to run through, here's the big problems, here's the cause, and here's what you should be doing. 
By the way, Josh, what do you do? Oh, I do this. Again, it's leading with education. You guys ever watch people cook on TV? Chefs? You watch them cook on TV, and then all of a sudden, you're walking by their restaurant, and you're like, I'm going to go in there. That's called the mere exposure effect. The socioeconomic principle that says, the more you're exposed to something in a positive way, the more you're going to gravitate toward it. It's why Coke advertises banners and billboards. They don't expect you to buy a Coke, but when you're thirsty, you're picking up a Coke. Now that blade cuts both ways. You could have positive exposure and negative exposure. Negative exposure is the sham wow guy. Am I dating myself? Do you know who the sham wow guy is? The infomercial of the guy trying to sell car products with a sham wow? The slimy salesperson? Or have you ever been seen advertising that you actually liked over and over again? Because it was educational and entertaining. So mere exposure effect is huge. And Chris has done a great job of this. The more people are exposed to you in a positive way, the more open they're going to be to want to start a conversation with you. And it's called the mere exposure effect or familiarity effect. So I, th I think we have laid a nice groundwork. And let's jump into it. So we talked about like prospecting in general, LinkedIn, content, video. Um, so if people have questions, we can take them right now. Again, like it can be general or super specific. I'm trying to sell additive manufacturing to this person. I've been working on this. It didn't work. What should I try? Like any, anything in the spectrum will help with. I think there was a question back here. Yeah. Because I agree with everything that you're saying. How do you sell this idea to your leadership in terms? Because I want to post TikTok videos on LinkedIn. TikTok, renegade, renegade. Yeah, but they're entertaining and they stand out. But I'm kind of told, well, no, that's not professional. But it just kind of blends in with the other. Because I work in the healthcare industry, it just kind of blends in with all the boring stuff. So, like, how do I sell sell this concept to a director, maybe a vice president? That's not convinced that that's the tactic that we so should So you got your, got your pen out? I want, you to take, I want you to take notes on this one. So Google Chris Voss Master Class. Because you're asking the wrong question. You can't sell anything to anybody because the more you try to persuade someone that doesn't want what you have, they're going to dig their heels in even deeper. Have you ever gotten to a situation where someone felt they love Donald Trump and you tried to convince them and they say, you know, I never thought about it that way. I don't like him anymore. Has that ever happened? <laughs> Will that ever happen to anybody? Will anybody ever change their mind? So you have to learn how to persuade and influence in a very different way. And Chris Voss is the master of it. So it starts, we, don't, we won't get into it on this call, but it actually starts with um, empathy and understanding. So, you know, my wife and I get into arguments and discussions all the time, and Chris Voss has improved my marriage, because I now know how to not push back and overcome. Normally, if you're at the dinner table and someone says to you, I'm for the wall, and if you're against it, you're going to push back, and what's going to happen? Tug of war, and they're never changing their mind. So the first thing I want you to do is it's 90 bucks, I don't make any money off of it, but it is going to completely change how you approach that person to be able to get what you want, but without you having to sell them on anything. So that, and that's going to help you in all aspects of your life. Oh yeah, awesome. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. And then when it works, they'll, they'll you know, they'll go crazy. Because that's what I do. He's also unemployed, but no, no I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. CEO like works you know, 100 feet from me. So yeah, it's The nice thing about this, the Chris Voss approach is that your CEO will actually end up thinking that it's actually his idea. I understand his perspective on a lot of things because there's a lot of instances where things can blow up and it can hurt you, especially if you're in a limited market share, limited kind of product business. Um, but the, the problem has become kind of like the, when great is the enemy of good, you know, you can't make a decision. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I, I'm trying to overcome. So, so quick, 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 quick crash course. Quick crash course. You can't tell people anything until they feel understood. Deeply understood. So one way to make people feel understood is to do 
what's called mirroring. Meaning that when someone says something to you, you repeat the last two or three words they said with an uptone. This might sound completely moronic and stupid. I am telling you right now that when you do that, people will keep talking. And when people keep talking and you're listening to them, they start to feel a little more understood. So Chris, I'm just cueing you now. You would say, feel understood? Feel understood? And I'm gonna keep talking. Notice that uptone. Do that in your personal life, do that with your boss. That's step number one. Step number two is to realize, uh-oh, I'm about to fight. I'm about to try to voice my opinion. Stop yourself. Notice that you're getting into the mind of trying to push back. And instead, I want you to what's called repackage what your boss just told you. It sounds, there you go, she just did a mirror. She just did a mirror, right? So it sounds like you feel that going outside of the box isn't going to be congruent with our brand and might actually upset our prospects and our customers. And if you do this right, what you're going to hear is, that's right. And this is after about a five or six minute conversation. And then you can ask what's called a calibrated question. Notice I'm not pushing back. Hey, how's it going to work if we want to grow and what we're doing isn't working? And then I'm going to do the hardest thing, which is to shut my mouth. And what you're going to do is you're going to let your CEO start to brainstorm some ideas. How's it going to work? So the Chris Voss one, again, in two minutes or less, when a hostage had someone, or a terrorist had a hostage, captive, and was asking for $50,000, Chris Voss, $50 million, Chris Voss said, how do I know she's alive? How's it going to work? And so what the terrorist did was actually get her on the phone and start talking. And through talking and listening, he ended up, after a while, just releasing her. Like, how's that going to work? So to Jenna's mom, who I just got in a fight with last week, she was trying to tell me where to drive in the car. Turn right, turn left, turn left. left. Bobby, how's it going to work if, if I turn right? There's not a, I'm not able to turn right because there's a sign that says not turn right. How's that going to work? Well, then go straight. Okay, thanks. <laughs> as opposed to stop telling me how to drive, which is going to escalate things. So the Chris Voss stuff is a game changer in, in everything that you do. It's going to level up everything you do. And just by your question, how do I get my boss to, how do I sell my, it's just the wrong frame of mind. And so you learn this approach, Calibre, and the, and the uh, advantage of the masterclass is you actually hear his voice. Because it's not just what you say. It's actually, when you listen to Chris's boss, he calls it a late night DJ voice. Slow. Hey, Bobby, how's that going to work if we are not permitted to make right hand turns? Oh, then go straight. That's an awesome idea. I'll go straight. I know that's a complete left turn. <laughs> so I was just going to ask who are you selling to? We're actually selling to hospitals, boards, hospital boards, um, their uh, safe patient um, and with handling and mobility programs. Um, so it's not just one person that we're selling to, it's, it's generally a board, CEOs, CFOs, CNOs, um, workman's comp, quality of risk. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that line of business, it's, it's not that hard to get attention, even though we're trying to kind of spread um, in, in some states it's driven by legislation mm -hmm. and we're now trying to spread you know our business on the east coast where it's not driven as much by um, legislation but by things like OSHA fines or patient falls or like pressure ulcers things like that mm -hmm. um, trying to go after that and kind of showing them where the problem is because right now they think well we can just handle the mobility programs ourselves but it's kind of trying to have that conversation of what they're not seeing like Nurses don't know where the lift equipment is, right? Yeah. Um, the different scenarios. Um, they may call lift team, and it takes 20 minutes for someone to get over there. In the meantime, their bariatric patient lost patients and got up and fell. You know, things like that. These are things that people that are, you know, executives that paid millions mm -hmm. of dollars for all this equipment that they think are going to drive them metrics, um, but they don't really know what's really going on and what the problems are and how they can benefit. From a service like ours, so it's it's you know we've been trying to tackle it from both ends, kind of how to get their attention, how to nurture, and then the long process of, of decision making that you have when you have to work with a board as opposed to one decision maker.
here's uh, something to think about. So I've worked in healthcare marketing before and medical device was a big one. And the whole company thought we were selling to the medical director of a certain department. And what happens when you have that person? They're too far away from the actual work to know what the pain point is. And they're, so they're not open to listening to you. They don't have, people think that the decision maker is always the highest ranking person. The lower people tell the person what decision to make. And so we, I started marketing online, specifically using Facebook ads, so this is kind of relevant for you, to respiratory therapists and nurses and you know, people that worked in ambulances and people like that. And magically, we started having more medical directors come to our website and ask if their sales rep would come and do a demo because we gave information to the people that actually felt the pain points. So that's something that I would consider trying. And if you're going for that level of people, I think Facebook and Instagram is going to be the way to do it. So, Thanks for that, because I had that idea. So and use, definitely use ads. That, that's a phenomenal point. And I see this in sales all the time. And here's the story. I sell copy machines. I notice that the copy machine is jammed up. The admin is taking a long time to make copies because she's constantly having to unjam the copy machine. So I send the note to the CEO. Did you know that your copy machine's jammed up? It takes forever. It's a big problem. Not to the CEO, it's not. I'm not making copies. That's what I pay this person to do, to Chris's point. The problem has to matter. The job has to matter to the person you're reaching out to. It has to matter to them specifically in their world for them to care. Are you selling copy machines to CEOs or are you trying to have the conversation with the person actually making the copies first? Mm -hmm. Great point. Cool. What else? So I see what you say about Taylor and the message differently, but I think the issue that would come up there is that the person making copy might not be the decision maker. I don't know if we covered that list like that, but so what do you, how do you, how do you sort of follow that up the chain? Yeah, so oftentimes when you sell, the person that you're originally talking to is not the person to make, that's making the decision. Uh, they are a champion of the sale, and there are ways to be able to work with that champion to be able to build a business case to actually help that person sell it up the chain, especially with enterprise sales. And that's a skill in and of itself. I mean, we'd have to get through to CFOs and we would actually create a CFO packet that enabled our champion to be able to sell it because they've never had to sell to a CFO before, but we had. So we developed these little packets and presentations. And when we would make them, we'd actually create videos. We'd walk people through it and mention the, mention the person's name and actually walk them through how to present it to the CFO how to build a business case for it. Because you can't rely on someone to sell it that might not know how to sell it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So in our industry, um, a lot of times we're talking to like, a, like an engineer. Someone calls us and you know, their boss or maybe they decide in some other group that they need to go buy a 3D printer and they reach out to us in a place where they're like on a checklist, like checking out features or something like that. And the value of additive manufacturing is solving like a bigger business problem, right? Where you can, you know, you're, you're somehow saving the company money or speeding up a process that uh, when we kind of bring up these like bigger picture ideas that allow us to hire an equipment, these guys are like, yeah, but you know, I, I got this printer that I see online on Amazon for 300 bucks and we're selling a $60,000 printer, right? And so there's a reason they're talking to us, but it's like they haven't quite connected the dots and we're having trouble like getting that guy to think at that other level and then communicate that to the people who really care about that. So I think you're creating a, a mistake. I think you're making a mistake. So let me explain it to you because I know why it's happening. Because you have commission breath. You want to sell a $60,000 printer. So let me tell you about my grandma. And, it, and we'll see how this relates. So my grandma had a toaster. And it sucked. Terrible toaster printer. Only one side worked. It made light toast and it took forever. Now I'm a sales guy. I'm gonna go in and sell my grandma a new toast. I bring these new toasters. Grandma, look at this toast. Two sides, fast, dark toast, new toaster user interface, digital display. Get that toaster out of my effing apartment, she would say. I could never sell the toaster to my grandma. It was far better than her toaster. Tell me why she didn't want it. It's better. It's 60,000. It's a better, more. It does all these things. Why didn't she want it? 
She didn't want to change. She didn't need it. No. She liked light toast. She wasn't in a rush, and she was only making toast for one. So just because your $60,000 printer can make two slices of toast, dark, with a new TUI, doesn't necessarily mean that the person you're selling it to wants two slices of toast dark and fast. So we got to find people that care about that stuff. And it's not my grandma. And that's a big mistake people make through no fault of your own because I'm selling toasters. Of course everyone's going to want it. It's better. It's got two slices. It's faster. Not to my grandma, it wasn't. And she died with that toaster. I still have it. Another thing I would say, it, people are calling you, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, we have, we have a lot of inbound. Our outbound is like, we need to be better at that, but it's almost non existing. Okay. And how, are they how do they find you? Um, we have people that find us on the web or uh, the vendors that we work with. We primarily sell equipment from like Switzerland to Germany. So people have like, found them, gone to those partners, and then those partners are kind of passing this, this contact or opportunity to lead to us. Okay. So it's often coming through the brand that you distribute, not through your own marketing. That's right. You okay. Say like 70% is coming through the brand. Okay. So it was, it was really like a, a sales question, right? Or do you have a marketing thing that you're trying to sell? It's a little bit of both. Because yeah. it seems like trying to upsell someone that's not ready. But typically when I see people that are coming inbound that don't really know what you want, it's because the messaging isn't right. They don't, they're not... They think that they're, look, they're calling you and getting something that, you're, that you don't offer because you haven't positioned the product online in the right way. Yeah, so guys, there's two ways to get business. You can do this, knock on someone's door. The advantage of that is I can pick the people's doors I want to knock on, huge advantage. Or you can have people knock on your door. Disadvantage of that, anybody can knock on your door. Mm -hmm. So the problem he's having right now is everybody's knocking on our door, but they don't need two slices of dark toast. What I would do, and maybe Chris has a different opinion, but I'm putting my outbound hat on for you especially, is like, where's the list of 30 people that need dark toast that might not know it? And I'm going to go after them and educate them on a big problem they don't know they're about to run into or an opportunity they might not be aware of. And that was my whole life. That's how I made all my money is, is outbound, finding outbound problems. Mm -hmm. Now, the sales cycle is a little bit longer because they're not ready right now, but you do enough of those conversations and you have a, a good nurture track in place. When the grill goes out and when they see the light, they're going to think of you. But the advantage is they're qualified because I picked them. Yeah. So like would... when I sold Geico, Principal, Verizon, like I picked those companies. I went after those companies and I got those companies because I was laser focused on those companies versus ones that are coming to me now with inbound. I get a ton of inbound leads, but most of them are just not fit. I would also create... I think videos is the easiest, but you, if you're better at writing, writing videos about the higher level business problems that you solve that the people don't know about. And then you can use that in Outbound or use it for marketing. Yep, yep. And you can go back to the strategy we introduced, which is go and pick the 30 people and then go invite them on your podcast because you want to figure out more about their actual business. And then you, f you can start wide and if it's appropriate, start to hone in on more of what you do you'll get a lot of great information. You also learn a lot more about your customers and you put that information out. Good. If, if I had to recommend one, one thing for you guys, everybody in the room, because I'm hearing the same theme, right? and you might want to write this down, jobs to be done. So jobs to be done is an approach that's not based on how you sell, but rather how people buy. And it turns out those two things are very different. And when you learn how people buy, it changes the game. Because you'll start to understand some of the things Chris and I are talking about and you start to understand where is somebody on the what I call struggleometer. Because if they're in the green zone of the struggleometer and only one pixel's out, I know that in about two minutes because they haven't tried some stuff on their own yet with regards to sales prospecting. And they're not a buyer today. So I don't waste my time with them. They're in my nurture track. Whereas, God, we've tried seven things. Nothing is working. We're about to lose our jobs, literally. They're in the red zone of the struggleometer. So this idea of jobs to be done and understanding the journey from the buyer's perspective, not the seller's perspective, is going to change the game. Change the game. Any other well, questions, God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go over to here. Yeah, so the concept, this concept of funnel, not a traditional sales funnel, but the marketing funnel from a perspective of somebody in the audience that you want to get to and getting them from knowing you, trusting you, buying you. How underrated or overrated do you guys think that concept is 
And is there any stage, it sounds like you've, you've talked a lot about adding value on the, at the awareness stage and then that will naturally make them flow. Is that what you think the lemon fruit is today or, or, or how do you see that? I see this, it's a, a very basic. Your website and your profiles and whatever channels you're on must communicate what you do and your differentiation. That's what I consider bottom and middle of the funnel. Everything else is just everyone's in the top. As you just want to be in, in someone, you want to be helping people and building awareness. I consider actually the funnel to be relationship-based. So I don't see them as they're in my prospecting funnel. I'm just building relationships with people and naturally people that you build relationships with. So I've, been, I've had a great relationship on LinkedIn for eight months with this chief commercial officer. She changed companies four months ago, went to this new company and reached out to me last week and said, hey, like I, we just hired a VP of brand. I'm going to introduce you to her. Let's set up a meeting for next Friday. Like sh she wasn't on my radar at all. I was building a relationship. Something happened with her that triggered her and she thought of me. So all we want, and Josh will say this too, all we want to do is be top of mind with a awareness of what problems or what we do, what problems we solve or what we do. And then allow the person to realize when they need to solve that, they think of you. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I don't, I, I actually don't believe in the funnel. I think it's, um, I don't think it's necessary in the content that you create through it. I don't think is needed. Look, we, we talked about this before, right? Chefs, they cook on TV. You watch a chef cook. You go into a store, you see their, their, you see their knife. Cool knife because you, 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 they've taught you stuff. So people talk about building relationships. I don't really know what that means. The only thing that I know it means is that works really well is out teach the competition. Like be a great teacher, be entertaining, teach people your take on it. And when they talk to you, they're going to be like, that's the teacher. Like, what's, I'm sorry, the guy that lives in Boca that's type texting. What, what was your name again? Seth. This guy, this, take your nose. So this, this guy, I don't, I don't know, this is a great example tonight. So I walked in here early. Seth was the first one here. And he walked up to me, Josh, oh my God. So I don't have any idea who this fucking crazy guy is coming up to me. Shaking my hand, how are you? Give me a hug. Talking about my wife. Your wife is here. How you doing, man? It's so, so great to, he knows me so well because he's been watching me for God knows how long. He trusts me. I can, he, he'll look at my stuff, buy stuff only because I've been teaching him for a while. I have no idea who he is until tonight. It's the same thing with, yeah, 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 this is, this is, a, this is a fan. So you have that too, and it's not, but the hard part is you have to know how to teach in a way that's entertaining, and you have to have a perspective. Like the I teach my wife sales shtick on LinkedIn is an attempt at entertaining people and teaching. And when I have a call, when people come in inbound, and they, I go, how'd you find out? Oh my God, I teach my wife sales. And I bring my wife into the Zoom cam. The sale is done. It's over. Jenna, oh my God, is that you? you I love that episode you did. And you can just feel the, because it's emotion. And then I'll justify it with logic. But you're the one that's been teaching me all these years. I'm not even going to look at anyone else. I want you, because people don't just buy what you're selling. They buy how you're selling it. They're buying you. They're buying you. So I don't know about relationships. All I know is I'm teaching and entertaining. Learn how to teach and entertain, whatever that means for you, whatever you want to teach. But not lose weight, don't eat. Some new spin, some new take. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to you. They'll, they'll start coming. Yeah. I'm with you. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the nurture track and earlier, not actually I have no background in this. I'm also an attorney, so I started my company all of a sudden, dumped into sales and marketing. I don't know why I asked my help. So, um, I, you know, it was so hard at the beginning where it's like, hey, you just checking in, following up, oh. going back, whatever. It's like, it's just, yeah, it's like so, it's so cringe, but um, it's improved. I've refined it, obviously, but it's not where I want it to be. So, I don't know if you could expand a little yeah. bit on, on what you thought is the construction for that type yeah. of thing. So, I'll, I'll give you a quick take on it. So, you guys are attorneys? Okay, so attorneys are always asked the same kind of questions over and over again. People ask you guys the same kind of questions over and over again. What I want you to do is I want you to turn on your iPhone, 
and I want you to answer seven questions that you're typically asked. Create two minute videos. And use a tool like Outreach or MailShake or GMAS, which is gonna drip out emails every month. And in each email, you're gonna put one of those videos. And whenever someone's not ready to buy, you're gonna say, hey, I have a series that I produce on the top questions that I'm typically asked around this topic. Is it okay if I could put you in that track? Sure. You drop them in there, and then automatically every month, they're gonna get one of your videos on your take on answering a question that you already went to law school to answer. You already know the answer to it. And guess what you're gonna do with those videos too? You're gonna pop them on LinkedIn, and that's gonna bring in leads. And you go to a networking event, instead of collecting a business card, which you're never gonna do anything with, say, hey, you know, instead of collecting a business card, I have this series called I Teach People About Law Stuff. Top questions about whatever. Would you guys like to be added to that? Everyone's gonna say sure. Then you get their email address, you drop them in there, and then every month, because you've set up an automated track and outreach or GMAS, these are tools that send emails out by themselves at certain intervals. So once a month it sends this, you just drop people into that track, and on month one it's gonna send video one, then it's gonna wait 30 days, and it's gonna send video two, and then video three. Just film five of them, you'll have five months of nurture. Simple, do it tonight. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for lighting, you don't need expensive cameras like what Chris has. You know, just your, just your camera. If you want to get, what do they call it, a selfie uh, cam, webcam stick? The young kids know this. The, the thing like, if you want selfie, selfie stick, stick, go get yourself a selfie stick. My wife made me get one because she didn't like how jittery the camera was. She wanted her to make it look better. So go get one of those and just start doing that. Simple. Mm -hmm. I call it a Tom sequence, a top of mind sequence. You don't have to, you know, just, you guys already have the con. Like, well, let me ask you a question, just seriously right now. What is one question people ask you? Startups, what is, this, what is a typical question someone in a startup asks you, typically? Um, should I use employees or independent contractors? Perfection. Should that, what, let me ask you a question. Hey, let me ask you a question. Are you filming this? Can we, can we zoom in on it? Because we're yeah. going we're to we're get you this. We'll, hey, do it right, we'll do it right now. Hey, uh, let me ask you a question. Should I use uh, contractors or independent employees? What does it depend on? Depends on what your business goals are, what the structure is. So what are things I should look at and consider when I'm considering uh, whether I should do either of these, or these things? So different agencies have different tests that they apply to determine whether or not you're actually using independent contractors. And so we will run through all of those tests together. They're each a little different. Can I add to that? Action. And that's your, that's your, that's your, you get the idea. That's done now. We send you the clip, that's your edited version. Mm -hmm. you can, you, now, we're skiing down the mountain for the first time, so it's gonna be a little bumpy, but you get the idea. After you do seven of those, hey, a question that you're gonna loosen up. Because right now, I talked to you before this session rolled, the camera's on you, people are looking at you, but when I was talking to you before, you were yourself. Hey, my name is, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, NDAs, do I need them? Here's my take. I'm so freaking lutely not, or yes, you do, and here's why. And, and that's, that's a question. Mm -hmm. You get the idea. She, she drew you in with the answer, but she didn't really answer the question. Because it's her first time skiing down the mountain. Mm -hmm. That's what lawyers do, though. Yeah. Yeah. The issue in our profession, though, is we're not allowed to answer the question. We actually cannot give free legal advice under the Florida Bar Rules. So I think the reason most lawyers clam up is we don't want to get in trouble. And there are very strict advertising rules in our industry that could cause you to lose your license. But can you talk about, but can you, can, I've seen lawyers giving information. I like, ca I like case study. What about case studies or something? Right, but usually it's with all these disclaimers, like, I am not your lawyer, I cannot give you legal advice, and that's because the Florida, well, all state bars are actually trying to protect consumers. So it could, it harder for us. So could you say that at the beginning, hey, uh, this advice is not, you know, a little disclaimer, here's some of the things you should be looking for and some of the things you should consider. You know, something like that. But there's ways to answer questions, even if you can't say, this is the exact answer. Mm -hmm. Let me do it with you, Mr. Hotshot, since he was calling her out. Let's put the camera, just real quick. <laughs> what's, one of the questions, what's one of the questions your prospects or customers will typically ask? Just one. Can you close the deal or when are you going to fund? Yes or no? So let me ask you a question. That's, That's what the whole conversation boils down to. And my number one, my number one way of getting clients is a $5 coffee. Tell me more and about it. And pay that. for the coffee. How do you do that? 
And, not, and I didn't say lunch, I didn't say happy hour. I said coffee and pay for the coffee. You purposely pay for the coffee. Because when you pay some, something, people remember who paid. And then when you call them back, like I say, a week or a month, you're, they'll, they'll answer that call just out of courtesy because you actually paid for the coffee. And then you can say, and that is known as the law of reciprocity, a popular thing by Robert Cialdini. And that's, so that's a perfectly nice answer to his question and it's his take. Now, is it a good take? Is it interesting? I don't know his audience, but he's answered a question. And that becomes his nurture track. How do I get in front of somebody? You buy him a $5 cup of coffee. That's, that's the idea. Anybody else uh, questions? One, two more. One or two more? Anybody else? So, like a lot of us, I'm in professional services. So, like, how much time do you actually spend on marketing? On I, LinkedIn? I, I, just in general. Uh, on right? marketing? Because, I mean, like, the work still needs to be to get done, right? So, it's, like, hard to kind of, like, get in that rabbit hole of just doing marketing all the time when actually you have got client work and deliverables. A couple of things. One, so we, we do marketing. So, I think the, the numbers are going to be different because um, I probably, in the beginning, when it was just me, I was spending two or three hours a day on marketing, and now I probably spend four or five. Um, but my job is predominantly marketing and sales now, not the client work. And so as I've, once I got to a level, and then you need to decide for yourself, are you better at the work? Or are you better at the marketing or the sales? Or like, what are you the best at? And then put the other people in place to do it. So like, I knew that out of the couple things, that I was the best and I, enjoy, and I also enjoyed it the most to actually do the marketing for my company. And I've built frameworks so that I have an awesome team that can do the work for our clients. And so I think you just need to, be, uh, to, to look and figure out what you think you're the best at and what you like the best. And then if you, what you like the best, do the, try and do the most of it. Obviously, you're going to have other things like I have to do. Yeah. And, and payroll Chris, and other things, but yeah. And Chris and I may disagree with this potentially, but if, uh, when I was starting off my freelance business, um, I did not focus on uh, inbound. Like I, I, what I did as a freelancer is I, I identified, here's my 20 clients that I think I could serve because I'm uniquely positioned. I work on my positioning, and then I do, I do cold outbound. Like cold emails work really well for me. And they're relatively easy to do, but you have to be really crispy and specific that you're not so general. So there's, a, there's an exercise you have to go through to really nail down who's the person that you're going to best serve, and niching is better. So athletes, not good. Triathlon people, a little bit better. Triathletes over 50 years old, better still. Triathletes over 50 that are doing 140.6 distance races, even better because I feel like you're talking to me. That's why there's no such thing as all sports magazine. So niching down and getting specific about their problems is cheaper to do because I'm targeted and the message is just gonna resonate way more. Uh -huh. Josh, we only work with triathletes that are old Jewish people over 50 trying to finish a 140.6 that have not been able to finish one so far. Me versus we work with athletes. I think you had a question. You are. We are. You right. specifically. All right. <laughs> I try to self-depreciate humor as best I can. Um, but so how do you recommend kind of getting around that? Again, I'm going to recommend the Chris Voss thing because it's not, objections are not things we want to get around. We could do a whole session on this and I'm super passionate about it. Objections are things we want to understand. So, so someone said, I have a, uh, some, whenever you're feeling the pushback, step one, oh my God, I'm feeling someone pushing. And my inclination is, I want to push back, stop yourself. Mirror. Repeat the last three words. Tell me more about that. It sounds like. Tell me more about that. Let them go. So how does it work if you want the opinion of someone about a legal issue, but you're not a lawyer? I don't know if that's the right calibrated question, but notice the, the intent. So someone says to me, I'm, I'm already using something. So a typical objection when I make a cold call, we're using something for that. Because guess what? Everyone's making fried rice today. Everyone's printing stuff. That's an objection I get every time I make a cold call. The, the, the most knowledge that people will say is, I got to convince them why to overcome it. But this is what I do. I say, are you using something? 
and they say, yeah, we're using this, we're using that, we're using this. So it sounds like you have sales training all set and your reps are firing on all cylinders. I go, that's right. And then I say this, I'm not sure if this is a fit, but would you be open to seeing if there are other possibilities that might not be on your radar in terms of increasing the amount of meetings that they're booking? Not for now, but at some point in the future, just so you can have it in your back pocket for a rainy day. That's something you'd be open to? Uh, sure, I'll take a look at that. Because they've been heard, and I'm ex positioning it as what's possible. Things that, possibilities, opportunities that you might not know about in terms of what they want. Very different than explaining to them why they should hire a lawyer or why they should trust lawyers. Because people are never changing their minds, ever. But there's also the takeaway. Like, this isn't a fit. Yes. And then, yes. like, the kind of uh, uh, offering of something for the future, no pressure. That's right. You're not, you're, you're going along with them after you've, you know, established the empathy and, like, kind of show them that, like, okay, well, you got it all covered here, but it's kind of... Yeah. yeah. So let's actually just practice it real quick. Now, I think all lawyers are swindlers. Now, you're going to say, I'm sorry, swindlers? Okay. So let's practice it. I think all lawyers are swindlers. I'm sorry, swindlers? Perfect. Notice she's, then they're gonna keep talking. Versus, let me tell you why they're not swindlers and go into that lawyer mode. Not lawyer mode, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean a conflict mode. If you just practice the mirroring, it's gonna change the game with regards to when people push back. So then what's the follow up for her? After she says, I'm sorry, swindling, and you say, well, yeah, like my experience has been da 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 da, and you go through it and you just like give then, it all to her. Then, then she goes through what's called tactical empathy. So that is, it sounds like you've had some really bad experiences with lawyers in the past that have caused you to lose a lot of money. And they're gonna say, that's right. And then all of a sudden now they're on your side of the table. And they're gonna be much more open now to what you have to say, which is a, then you ask a calibrated question. Well, how are you gonna solve that? What are you gonna do when you have this legal issue? How are you gonna, I'm gonna have them solve the problem, not me. Someone says, I don't have budget for this. What are your thoughts? Rather than some salesy line. And we could do a whole, I know we're way off topic here, but we could do a whole topic on how to not overcome objections, how to diffuse through understanding. And it was going to work wonders in your personal life too, and when you sell things to your bosses. And again, Chris Voss is the master. This is a little less, um, less tactical, more strategic, but what do you like outside of law? Ooh. You know, we sort of reached out representing video game companies and gamers, and I've been able to close those sales fairly easily because I am a bit of a casual afro gamer on my own. Okay. Those conversations feel more natural, and it's not sausage factory. Most people don't care how lawyers do the work they do. They're not interested. I know that. And so usually when it's something that we can both connect on, and when you're working with a lawyer who maybe isn't condescending about something that you find interesting in your industry, that's gone well for for my firm. So we're working with tech companies and more modern entrepreneurs. I would create content about the video games. Totally. Not about being a lawyer. Yes. That's awesome insight. And then they click on your profile and see that you're a lawyer or they see your headline. That's what I would do. I love that idea. Double down on that. That's awesome. I, I love that idea. I don't know anything about it, but I like it. <laughs> uh, we've got time for maybe one more if anybody yeah. has final question. You guys have been a pure delight. Thank you guys so much. You guys have been great. Thank you so much.